<laughs> There's a question that you know we encounter in, in math class typically in a pretty standard kind of question and on math tests as well. And you know we don't it's not a, a typic, it's not a terribly interesting or deep question. Um, you know we kind of conjure up the formula, uh, compute five factorial, write the answer down and and move on. We don't think too deeply about it. Because when we come to this problem, we think about books on a bookshelf, like this. Well, <laughs> that was a little fast. <laughs> we think about books on a bookshelf, <laughs> like this, or this or this, you know, sort of the standard books on a bookshelf way. We don't think about books on a bookshelf like this, or this, and certainly not like this. <laughs> we come to this problem with the a particular set of assumptions about how books behave and what we can do with them. And in essence, we come to the problem with a, a model in mind. And so we don't ask questions about this. And students don't ask these questions either, which is a shame because we want students to ask questions, especially in mathematics. So what I want to talk about is just some of the ways that I see standardized tests undermining the teaching of mathematical modeling and the learning of modeling uh, for students. So welcome to G equals four and other lies the test told me. So we'll return to this question and just for a moment think about all of the assumptions that we have about this problem that we never think about, like that the books are distinguishable and that the bindings are out and that they're right side up and they're arranged vertically and they're flush to each other. So these are things that we sort of unconsciously assume about the problem. And so we don't ask these questions and students don't ask these questions, which is again a shame because there are some interesting questions and conversations to be had about different ways that perhaps you could arrange books on a bookshelf. One of the reasons that students don't ask these questions is because it won't help them find that the answer is 120 on this test. In fact, it'll probably work against them, right? Thinking deeply about how you could arrange books on a bookshelf is probably not the best way to use your time uh, and might even give you the wrong answer. So the message here, don't ask questions. Here's another problem, a dartboard problem, the second dartboard problem of the night. I hope, I hope it's not spoiled. Um, you know, this is a, a geometric probability problem. We're all familiar with this kind of problem. You know, but when you look closely at the text of this problem, you notice something very important is missing. The assumption is that every spot on the dartboard is equally <coughs> likely to be hit. I mean, whether that's true or not is an interesting question, but notice here that the assumption is not even acknowledged here in this problem. So, that's a very important assumption. In fact, that's the assumption that makes this problem tractable. And that assumption is the model in this question. And it's not, its existence is not even, not even acknowledged. So I think the message here for students, a subtle one, is that don't worry about the model. You don't have to think about it. Just calculate the geometric probability. Here's a very abbreviated version of this problem. This is a famous one from a couple of years ago. Uh, about a straw in a rectangular prism. And uh, they want you to find uh, the longest, you know, they want you to find the length of the straw. And so what the problem wants you to do is use the Pythagorean theorem, or the three-dimensional version, and calculate and write the answer down. And if you do that, and of course show appropriate work, uh, you get full credit. But what about the radius of the straw? Like, they went to the trouble to create a problem involving a straw, and they even drew you a picture <laughs> with a straw. This picture was included. And the straw has a, a non-negligible radius. And it's not addressed anywhere in the problem or in the solution, which I would consider a conceptual error on the part of the uh, makers of this exam. But again, the issue here is that, you know, what, what message is this sending to students? It's, sending, it's telling them that, yeah, the model's not really that important. Yeah, there's a radius to the straw, but you know what? Forget about it. <laughs> and this is uh, my all-time favorite. This is a problem about a, 
a, a diver diving off of a, a, some sort of platform, and their height is, is modeled by this quadratic function. And the question is, uh, what's the lowest uh, they get below the water? And this seems like a pretty modest problem. Diver dives into the water, submerges, t equals 3. They get their lowest uh, point. You write the answer down, and you move on. Of course, an interesting thing happens if you let time wind on. <laughs> the diver actually rises out of the water because, because the, the equation they use to model height, it's quadratic, but it's not the right model. And so it turns out that they're assuming that g equals 4. The acceleration of gravity is actually positive and about half what we experimentally know. And uh, again, like the idea, the, the message here is that yeah, okay, well, there's a model, but you know what, it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. Just, just find the, the lowest point of that quadrant. So I think these tests in some ways are training kids not to ask questions, and they're excluding them from the modeling process. They're making it something separate from them. And uh, in some cases, or even teaching them that the model is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. So what do we do about this? Well, one thing I do is I write about it. And I've been surprised at how many great professional experiences I've generated by writing about my experiences, like thinking about these problems, talking about them. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's really a great thing. Like, there are a lot of great teachers out there who are interested in talking about these things, and, and it's created a lot of learning opportunities for me. Like, here's a good example. Um, this is a problem from last year's exam. Uh, and uh, a colleague and I, after looking at about a thousand of these, uh, Scott, uh, Matthews, and I, uh, we got the sense that, you know, we didn't really think this was a tree function. <laughs> so I checked. And it's not really a tree function. So I wrote about it. And uh, I was really surprised at how rich a discussion emerged from just this very simple sort of problem. Like, people thought, well, it's interesting. Maybe that's two halves in an ellipse. Because we all sort of think, like, how do they generate this curve? And then someone said, well, it was done in, in Adobe, so Adobe uses Bezier curve, so maybe it's that. And then someone was like, hey, is that a discontinuity in the second derivative <laughs> of that function? And so we had this really, like, wide-ranging, interesting conversation. And it, was, uh, it went on so long that it actually got the attention of Timothy Gowers, who's a fields medalist. And... He's like you know, a world-renowned math, uh, mathematician, and, and he noticed this and, and commented on it. It was like just a, an amazing professional experience for me to write a simple post about some silly question, and you know, we're having this wide-ranging conversation. So we can use these opportunities, I think, to create opportunities for us to reflect on, on you know, what we're doing and, and how we do it. But we can also you know, turn it on to the, the students. Like, why don't you explore how many ways you can really arrange books on a bookshelf? Come up with some interesting questions, mathematical questions, and explore those things. Um, or challenge students to dream up an explanation for how someone could dive and then magically be pushed up. <laughs> or just be warned that you're going to see some really crazy stuff, like a guy holding a, an enormous proton jumping towards a positively charged surface <laughs> in space where gravity is negligible. Uh, that was, this was the most uh, publicly appropriate version of this, uh, of this I got. Uh, or have students uh, speculate and conjecture about how darts would actually fall on a dartboard. Or make a dartboard and throw some darts and collect some data and analyze it. In other words, use real mathematical modeling to engage the students in these sort of faulty, silly models that they encounter every day. So we can turn bad practice into learning opportunities, like for us and for our students. And we can refine how we think about and teach modeling and the messages we send to students every day about modeling through what we do and how we test them and the kinds of problems we give them. And in some cases, we can engage students directly in modeling by challenging these models. And hopefully, we can work to dispel some of the misconceptions that mathematics is artificial and removed from them and, and meaningless. And we can get them to, we can get students to, to see it as meaningful and powerful and creative and uh, get them to ask questions and get them to see that there are more than 120 ways to arrange five books on a bookshelf. 
Thank you.